So I'm Paul Pettis, the Director of PR and Communications for Centerplate and Sodexo Sports and Leisure here in North America. It's our pleasure to welcome everyone here today in honor of, of World Oceans Month to today's cooking demo. And we have Chef Brandon Felder, the, the Executive Chef for Centerplate at the Ernest N. Morial Convention Center in New Orleans with us today. He's gonna walk us through some New Orleans style cooking for everyone to make at home while we're still locked up during this quarantine and pandemic. In addition to directing all the activities of our culinary personnel in New Orleans and providing leadership and development to our chefs and culinary team there at the convention center, Chef Brandon supports our efforts at the Mercedes-Benz Superdome, Smoothie King Center, and the National World War II Museum, all in New Orleans, which are serviced by Centerplate and our parent company, Sodexo. With these venues and hopefully Saints and Pelicans games around the corner prepping to reopen, we wanted to share with all of you today a taste of the bayou, some of Chef Brandon's go-to meals to enjoy at home. We're also joined by Chris Robbins, the Senior Manager of Science Initiatives for Ocean Conservancy, and Jeff Barger, Associate Director of Constituent, of Constituent Outreach, also at Ocean Conservancy. This year also marks the 10-year anniversary of the BP oil disaster. The BP Deepwater Horizon oil rig, when it exploded 10 years ago, was one of the worst environmental disasters in US history, spilling more than 200 million gallons of crude oil and 1.8 million gallons of chemical dispers dispersants into the Gulf of Mexico. Over the last decade plus, Ocean Conservancy has played a crucial role in the recovery of the Gulf, and Chris and Jeff will talk today about the importance of a healthy Gulf of Mexico to New Orleans and the entire Southwest. Centerplate also has been on the ground that entire time in New Orleans, doing our part to help always support the health of local waterways and buying from local fisheries as much as possible. We value our partners in New Orleans greatly and thank our local friends who are joining us here today. We also know that we have a responsibility to use our platforms for good. As people across the country and the globe protest for justice and an end to police brutality and racism, we stand united with the black community. We like to use today's event to support black owned businesses in New Orleans, and we'll be sharing helpful resources later and in our follow-up materials for restaurants in the New Orleans area that you can support. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chef Brandon Felder, who's gonna show us more today about making a delicious crawfish slaw salad and a seared snapper, both of which are absolutely delectable. Chef, take it away. The mic is yours. Hi, how are you? I'm Chef Brandon Felder at the uh, New Orleans Convention Center. Welcome, um, I'm here to show you two dishes today, and I'm gonna walk you through first the, uh, the crawfish slaw salad. We have everything prepped up right here. So I have my I have my crawfish right here battered in a little bit of Louisiana fish fry. Um, I got my oil around 350 degrees. I'm gonna drop some in for probably about a minute, minute and a half, depending on color. We'll put two in the end. So while these are Brian, I'm just going to a little toss right there. Let me zoom in on that bit. So, so basically, these, these crawfish, we're, we're at the tail end of our season, pretty much the end of our season right now. Um, we get these from like the Chapalaya Basin, so a little bit, a little bit north of here on, the, on our way to Texas. And um, one of our favorite seasons just brings everybody together. Like, you're outside, you're drinking beer, you're eating crawfish. It's, Family, friends, and it's just a great atmosphere. So these, you're just looking for a little bit of golden brown on them. And we are going to share these recipes of, of the dishes that Chef is making in follow-up afterwards today. So yep. we'll be sure to share all of these steps for you to make these yourselves at home as well. Awesome. All right. So these, these are these are nice and crispy. I'm gonna go ahead and take them out and uh, let them drain off a little bit. And then we'll go uh, we'll go build our slaw. So I just used uh, a little bit of canola oil, just a, a neutral oil, just to fry them in. You want to make sure their the oil your oil is hot or the crawfish anything you're frying will get soggy. So. 
All right, all those are off. We'll let those drain for a little bit. They're, the uh, the batter I used is Louisiana hot, so I'm not going to season them anymore. They're already really hot, and I soaked them in a little bit of butter milk and uh, Tabasco hot sauce. So we're going to come around here. We're going to have we have uh, our our shredded napa cabbage, we have purple cabbage, shredded carrots, a little bit of green onions. I'm going to go ahead and add some of my uh, Italian parsley to it. Uh, Italian parsley gives it the, the nice freshness to it. Uh, a little bit of cilantro will give you that, that brightness. Um, I made a Tabasco vinaigrette. I used all local ingredients. I used my, my favorite cane, cane vinegar. I used some, um, some local honey from Mandeville. Of course, Tabasco. And uh, you can make this as hot or as as hot as you'd like it. Uh, I put about, I put a little bit in there. You can see how much I put in there. I have it on the recipe card as well. And a little bit of Zatarain's Creole mustard for binding to keep it emulsified. So what I'll do is I'm just gonna go ahead and mix this. Went ahead and put it in my, uh, this, is, this is how we make salad dressing at home. So I'm gonna go ahead and add some of my salad dressing to it. We're gonna mix it. You want it, you want it coated and you actually wanna make this a little ahead of time. So that you can, uh, so it can sit and kind of marinate in there. We'll have that. We'll add the rest of our herbs to it. So, like I said, if you, uh, depending on how how spicy you'd like it, how spicy you don't want it, it's all up to you. You can use a different hot sauce if you'd like. We just prefer Tabasco because it gives it that little little extra kick. So that looks pretty. It's nice and colorful, bright. So we'll go ahead and we'll plate this up. You can serve this at a plate. But we like to serve it kind of family style, so everybody can kind of dig in themselves. And then you just garnish with uh, some some of the fried crawfish on top. It's a, uh, it's a, it's definitely a winner. And plating, of course, is crucial in all of this, as Chef is showing now. Presentation is half the battle, so. <laughs> well, my, my wife picked out all the dishes, so that's good. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's our first dish, and that's pretty simple and easy. Anybody can do it at home. Uh, it's just a few ingredients. You can actually get a, a coleslaw pre-mix. You don't have to cut it all up yourself. Oh, but this is it, and uh, you just dig in from there. Thanks, and, and while you prep for your second dish, that seared snapper, as we all prepare to bite through our computers, uh, we're going to ship it to Chris, who's going to talk to us a bit more about Ocean Conservancy and their efforts over the last few years in New Orleans. And uh, Chris, I give the floor to you. Hey, thanks so much, Paul and, and Chef, for having us here today. Um, it's really an honor to be at the virtual table with you guys. Uh, Cajun cooking is, of course, world-renowned, and it's a personal favorite of mine, so I'm really looking forward to getting some tips that I can use here at home and in my kitchen, which is literally 10 feet that way. Um, so as Paul mentioned, I'm the senior manager of science initiatives at Ocean Conservancy, and for the past 10 years, I've been part of our Gulf Restoration Program. And it uh, goes without saying that one of the things that makes Louisiana and New Orleans special unique is its cuisine. And seafood is so central to that cuisine and is deeply embedded in its history, culture, and economy. And Paul uh, mentioned the 2010 BP oil disaster um, was really a, a jarring and, and tragic event, not unlike Hurricane Katrina before it or what's going on now in the world with the pandemic. Um, the, the oil disaster harmed, you know, the coastal and offshore habitats that, you know, really stay many of the species like shrimp and oysters or red snapper that are seafood staples there in New Orleans cuisine. And just as a reminder to folks, you know, the explosion of the BP Deepwater Horizon oil rig that tragically ended the lives of 11 people back on April 20th. 2010 and set off one of the wor worst environmental disasters in U.S. history. Um, you know, the impacts were, were immediate, acute, and long-term. 
Uh, the oil spill sickened and killed, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of birds and sea turtles, marine mammals, um, something like between two and five trillion larval fish were killed, according to some of the estimates. Um, but, um, you know, we just commemorated the 10th anniversary of the beginning of the spill back in April of 2010, and we will commemorate the anniversary of the capping of the well on July 15th. And I really want to focus on, on the silver lining of the spill, which was really the billions of dollars that are now available uh, for restoration throughout the Gulf of Mexico and Louisiana. Uh, in 2015, BP agreed to a $20 billion settlement over 20 years. And today those funds are being channeled into Gulf-wide restoration in an effort to restore coastal marine resources that were impacted by the oil disaster, as well as the health of the broader Gulf ecosystem. Um, and, and the funding you know, gives Louisiana and the region really an unprecedented opportunity to invest in projects that not only fortify the coast against things like climate change, but allow us to invest in offshore habitat mapping and innovative fisheries uh, restoration projects get, that could really uh, help us rebuild depleted fish populations such as red snapper, red grouper, vermilion snapper, etc. Um, so as, as Chef gets rolling here, we'll talk about some of the victories for the Gulf of the last few years, shed light on some of the, the positives that have um, resulted from the funding out of the oil spill. And in the meantime, um, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Jeff, for his thoughts. Go ahead, Jeff. It's all yours. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, and Paul, thanks. Thanks for having us, Chef Brandon. Uh, thanks for sharing your kitchen with us. I'm definitely going to hit you up on some pointers on your crawfish batter. As a southern boy, I've eaten fried food my whole life, and I still quite, can't quite get it right. So I'm really curious to pick your brain about that in a little bit. Right. Um, my name is Jeff Barger. I'm the Associate Director of Constituent Outreach for Ocean Conservancy. I'm also based here in Austin, Texas, but I'm real fortunate to be able to work with the men and the women, the men and women of the fishing industry all around the Gulf and other parts of the country um, as well, but to, to ensure healthy and sustainable fisheries and ocean ecosystems. Uh, before I get started, I just wanted to take a minute and wish everyone happy Oceans Month. For those of you that didn't know, June is um, Oceans Month, and here at OC, we've been doing a lot of a lot of events and participating in a lot of talks to kind of celebrate and talk about some of the some of the challenges um, that we see in the ocean. And whether you realize it or not, we're all connected to the ocean. You know, the oceans cover about seventy percent of the planet. They regulate our weather and our climate. They're the source of about half of the oxygen that we breathe and it provides li a livelihood for millions of people. And it's also the primary source of protein for, for billions of people. So, so, you know, I really, I think, I think the uh, esteemed marine biologist, Sylvia Earle said it really said it best, best. She said, with every drop of water that you drink and every breath that you take, you're connected to the sea, no matter where on earth you live. And I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. So, um, and with that, I also wanted to say, I wanted to thank center plate again. Um, you know, in the South, football is king. You know, we were really excited to work with you guys at the Super Bowl this past year. It was a great, great set of events. And I think it's awesome to be able to continue this great partnership. So thank you for helping put this together. I've been working in the Gulf of Mexico uh, for close to two decades. And I've really been able to witness firsthand how important our coastal and marine resources are to the region. And it's not just the economic benefits and the food, I'm really talking about the deep cultural identity um, that our fishing communities have. And I have to say, of all the places that I've traveled, there really is no place like Louisiana, and New Orleans in particular. Its people are some of the most resilient in the country. It's, it's, it's got such a rich and diverse culture. You know, it just gives it a style all its own. You know, and geographically speaking, it's situated right there between Lake Pontchartrain and the Mississippi River, and just north of one of the country's largest wetland and estuary um, ecosystems. There really is no place where folks are more connected to the natural world. And of course, this is reflected in the food. Um, when I think of New Orleans, I think of great seafood. You know, Chef mentioned it as well. Like New Orleans and Louisiana is the only place I know that they have their very own season 
centered around seafood. Um, it's, you know, crawfish season, Chef mentioned it earlier. You know, culturally, like community events, all gatherings all tend to center around coming together around food. Quite often it's, you know, shrimp or oysters or, or fish or crawfish in New Orleans. And so I know Chef knows that intimately. Um, that's his profession. And, you know, I'm, you know and it, when you look at the fisheries as a whole in the United States, you know, the industry is an economic engine for these coastal communities. And, and New Orleans is a perfect example of that. You know, across, across the country, when you, look at, when you look at commercial and recreational fisheries, it supports 1.7 million jobs. And it generates like over 212 billion in sales impacts. And that was back in two, 2016, which is unfortunately the last year we've got the data. But um, it just kind of gives you a sense of the scale um, of this and Louisiana stands its ground. You know, they, they, um, Louisiana had the second highest volume of landings in the nation in 2018. Over a billion pounds were landed. Um, two, two of the main seafood ports in Louisiana, the Venice area and intercoastal city, I believe, are, are constantly within the top 10 um, largest in the nation, both for seafood volume and seafood value. Um, you know, in the Gulf of Mexico, we eat a lot of shrimp. In, in 2018, there were over 215 million pounds of shrimp that were landed in the country. 74% um, um, so, uh, at 74% of the, all the fish that are caught in the nation. Louisiana was the largest state within the nation with over 90 million pounds. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to see where, where the, you know, where, where healthy, healthy Gulf ecosystems, healthy estuaries are, are really important to um, the culture of Louisiana, the, the economy of Louisiana. So, so I think that's, I think that's really, um, you know, a really telling thing about, about the importance of our, our, our ecosystems. Um, Chef's going to be doing a red snapper dish here shortly, and um, I'm really excited to see that, Chef, because it's one of my favorite fish in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, it really is the signature dish. I mean, in my opinion, it's the signature dish. Um, they're extremely popular um, for recreational uh, fishermen, and, and certainly they're prized in restaurants and, and in kitchens, you know, around the country, but especially in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, Louisiana lands about 20% of the Gulf's overall red snapper every year. So when, and, and when you're looking for a sustainable fish to eat, we'll talk a lot today about sustainable fish. When you're looking for those sustainable fish to eat in the Gulf of Mexico, you really can't make a better choice. Um, you know, the fishery is very well managed. Um, it's grown back in the 1980s. It was at historic lows. And due to uh, the combination of a strong federal policy, and fishermen who actually banded together along with conservation organizations like Ocean Conservancy and others really decided that they were going to make a change. And so they created a management system. They've been able to stay within their quota. They've got, they're able to land fresh product year round. And so it's a really great, it's a really great fishery um, and a fish, fish to eat. And Jeff, um, just, just quick, what, what's the um, question that the audience might be interested in? What is the reason for snapper being so great for the environment? Can you just go a bit more into, into why snapper is such a great fish to, to cook if you're concerned with the health of oceans and being sustainable? And what, what, what is the importance of snapper and why, why that fish? Well, it's, it's really, you know, the points that I made in terms of the fishery. You know, in, back in the 80s, they were in this derby and the fishermen would go out and they, they, had, they were able to fish the first 10 or so days of every month. And, and they would just go out and they would fish as hard as they could, as fast as they could. If you had bad luck and you blew an engine that day, or if you had a graduation or something like that, you couldn't go fishing. And so they would go out and, and the fishing effort was so great that, that they couldn't keep the fishery within its, within its limits. And so the fishermen kind of came together and developed a system that allowed them to keep better track of their own individu individual landings. Um, they manage it kind of like a bank account. It allows them to provide fresh product, year around you know back in the derby days they were um they'd have they'd go out for the first 10 days and then everything that they didn't sell immediately got frozen and so so that you know so they so you know the, the quality of the product went down the price went down um and they were they were consistently going over their established limit which led to stock declines and so so to me that that's really 
you know, it is that they like banded together. We've worked to have a stronger fisheries law um, to really, you know, like, I think, I think back in as early as the mid nineties, late nineties, excuse me, early two thousands, the, the annual um, poundage that you could take out of the Gulf of Mexico was, was, you know, below 5 million pounds. And today it's over 15 million. And so that's come back, you know, tremendously. Snappers are very, very long lived fish. And so it, so if you're not careful, you can overfish them. You know, the oldest red snapper, I believe, has been uh, calculated about uh, 57, 57 years old. So when you have those long lived fish like that, if, you know, if you're fishing too hard on them and they can't reproduce fast enough, it takes a while to build them up. But they're in a rebuilding plan now. Um, you know, they're on track, um, they're, they're, they're doing really well. So, so yeah, like I said, you know, there's, you know, our, some of our groupers are in similar management and, and, you know, most of them are doing, doing well, but as far as sustainability, red snapper really, in my opinion, um, is, is king in the Gulf of Mexico. So, um, I'll just add that, um, the shrimp fishermen have also done their part to help rebuild the uh, red snapper fishery. In the 80s and 90s, the shrimp fishing uh, fishermen and trawlers were catching a lot of, unintentionally catching a lot of juvenile red snapper in their trawl nets. And so with the advent of what they call bycatch reduction devices, the shrimp uh, fishermen can, can reduce their, their accidental catch of juvenile red snapper while maximizing their catch of, uh, of shrimp. And so this is one of, the, one of the restoration projects we'll talk about in a minute, but um, it was really a full court press, you know, to go throughout the Gulf of Mexico to get the red snapper fishery, um, you know, back online and, and more sustainable. That's awesome. And, and again, we'll certainly include a lot of these takeaways and insights in our follow up materials afterwards. So let's flip back to the kitchen for a moment. Chef, let's uh, get the snapper on the grill and get going. So what's, what's the latest step that we've got to get the snapper started? Okay. Yeah, um, so I, I butchered the fish this morning, and I actually threw in uh, two golf shrimp to go with those. We, uh, I, I saw them, they were absolutely gorgeous, so I figured we'd put them on top as a little bit of lanyard. So I got my uh, I got my pan pretty hot right now. I bring it to a, a mild smoking point, so that way I can get a good sear on the fish and the shrimp. Uh, we're going to go skin side down on both sides. I feel like taking about two minutes to throw the shrimp in on the other side, feed them a little bit of turning back and taking the What we're doing is we just want like a, I just want a hard sear on both sides just to get that nice crust in there. And Chef, we have a question from Brittany in Virginia. Where, uh, what kind of uh, a store did you go to to get these fish? Was it a, a local fisherman or? So I actually went to our local, um, just our local grocery store, so uh, the name's Ralph's, and uh, they have everything you can imagine. It's a, uh, it's a very, very nice store. Uh, they, it, the assortment of fish they have is incredible, and we do have a lot of other resources around here. I, um, I could have easily called any for there that they would have had it for me. But uh, it's, it's easy for us to find. So I'm going to flip my shrimp real quick. See how my, uh, my fish is doing. Want a little more color on that. It shouldn't take any time at all. And basically, I like to cook my shrimp. It's going to sound weird. I like to cook them medium rare. Just because of the carryover time. Basically, if I stop doing it now, by the time it gets to the plate, it'll be done. And then we'll move on to the uh, sort of the mock stew. This is going to be a corn mock stew. It's a Cajun corn dish. So I'm starting off with some, uh, some tricolor bell pepper and some uh, red onions for color and some sweetness. I'm going to throw in my uh, bicolored corn. And chef, just really quick, your, your, your sous chef is doing a great job on the camera. I think that his, his or her hand is on the mic, though. Your audio is a little muffled. Okay. Let me pull there this we up. Go. Much better. You hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So this is our uh, our corn mushroom. I um, I cheated a little bit before we started. I uh, I sweated down my my onions and bell peppers, and I had the recipe for that. And uh, basically, this just needs to cook down a little bit. 
You know, once this gets started, basically it's like a corn, corn and pepper. You can cook it down a little bit with a little bit of cream. I'm gonna add some garlic to it right now. And chef, th th this is the kind of dish that. If you're in New Orleans, you can eat at our convention center, Saints, Pelicans games, uh, the World War II Museum. This is a, a, the, the kind of dish that people can eat if they come to eat with us in New Orleans, correct? Absolutely, yeah. You, you can find this dish pretty, it's, it's pretty popular around. Um, I was actually, I'm filling in at the World War II Museum a few days a week just to get them back open. And uh, we actually have mock food on the menu right now. That's awesome. And then hey, I uh, started my uh, my berbalami. You, you can see this. This is working right now. This is really good. I'm gonna add a little bit more olive oil to it. And Jeff, I think you had a question for Chef. Yeah, Chef. Just whenever whenever it's convenient, I'm just curious. Um, you know, what are some of the things that you look for when you source your fish? Um, you know, you said you went to Rouse's Market, which is, you know. A great market um, you know they are pretty fantastic but like you know maybe in more in a professional setting or like what are you looking for um, in terms of uh, your fish so I don't like this I, I, I can source my fish no more than a hundred miles from where we are in the city so we, we talk to our fish our our mom I, I use New Orleans fish house we talk to them every day and I ask my guys and just just like hey like, what what is what do you have today or what are you gonna have on if it's Monday, what are you gonna have on Thursday or the weekend? It's it's the freshest. Um, so basically, I like to label my all my menus as seared golf fish, just to give it that broad. I guess that that, that broad subject of, of we don't know what we're gonna get that day, but it's gonna be the freshest and best fish that we have. So that's that's kind of the relationship we have with them. It's it's um, we call them every day. We talk to them. We have a great relationship. And, you know, we, we buy from them because they have they have the best stuff. Great. Great. So as you continue with that, uh, Chris, do you want to give us some more detail details on the restoration work and efforts over the last decade in making sure that New Orleans is a healthy and viable seafood community? Yeah. So um you know, I, I was talking with Chef a couple of days ago, and, and we were kind of reminiscing about the oil spill, and, and he said that he remembers, you know, where he was on the day of the BP oil disaster when, it, when the rig blew up, and he was at the Intercontinental Hotel there in New Orleans, and, and like him, I remember that, that day and seeing those searing and sobering images of the Deepwater Horizon mobile drilling platform, you know, engulfing planes, and and before it sank, you know, 5,000 feet to the, the Gulf seafloor. And of course, my heart sank and went out to, you know, the families who lost loved ones who were working on the rig. Um, and at its peak, as this image shows, the, the oil spill, including surface slicks and the sheen that was observed on uh, satellite imagery, um, directly covered or impacted an area of 68,000 square miles of the ocean, which is as big as the state of Oklahoma. So this, this spill, the image here kind of gives you a sense of the, the scope of, uh, of the spill and some of the challenges that we face in the restoration effort. Um, you know, the disaster affected just about every part of, of the Northern Gulf ecosystem from, from the smallest, you know, microbes to the largest marine mammals, such as sperm whales. <clears throat> However, you know, the amount, of, the amount of funding that's now available for restoration is being put to good use by the government agencies that have been tasked with the restoration charge. And these agencies are collectively called the natural resource trustees. They are trustees making decisions about restoration on behalf of the public, public trust resources. Um, you know, Gulf Coast communities and the tourism and fishing industries um, will ultimately you know, benefit from these investments through you know, fortification of, of the coastline and healthier habitats and wildlife and fish populations. And my job at Ocean Conservancy the past 10 years has really uh, meant to help to ensure that decision makers are using and the best available science to prioritize restoration dollars. Uh, we put out various planning tools, including a restoration framework for the Gulf back in 2011, 
and a coastal and marine uh, atlas that was intended as a resource for uh, agencies and staff working on restoration, as well as to really help inform the public and get citizens engaged in the restoration process. Um, and at OC, we've been, you know, we've advocated from day one that a chunk of the money for restoration be spent on open ocean restoration. <clears throat> and uh, when the settlement was announced in 2015, we happily learned that $1.2 billion had been dedicated to the open ocean with billions more, of course, for coastal projects. Um, so, you know, we identified and advocated for a scientifically sound, high impact marine and fishery restoration projects, um, you know, by producing booklets and providing comments during public comment periods. Um, and many of the projects that we had prioritized uh, for funding, you know, were approved, at least in the first tranche of funding. Um, and again, these are not projects that Ocean Conservancy will undertake itself, but these are ones that we thought, you know, should be approved, should be funded, you know, by the trustees to be implemented by the broader community. Um, and so in December of last year, the first ever open ocean uh, restoration plan was released to the tune of a quarter of a billion dollars um, to restoring you know reef fish such as red snapper reducing accidental bycatch of reef fish and sea turtles that are that are caught in shrimp trawls and, and mapping the hard bottom essential fish habitats that will ultimately help um, sustainable fisheries in the gulf and i will say something that personally um, impresses me about the, the plan is the open ocean plan is that it doesn't contain one new regulation. All of the actions in, involving the fishing community, for example, will be, will be voluntary and will be done in partnership with the government. So I, I'm happy to go into some of those projects, um, you know, as, as time permits here, but um, I think I'll, I'll pass it over to, to Jeff for some of his thoughts. Sure, Chris. I, I have a couple of thoughts and I'm going to throw a question back your way as well. Um, you know, I think, you know, you, you lay out a good, good rationale for, for why this restoration has been, you know, the restoration work is so critical. Um, you know, we, we, we mentioned earlier that the Gulf has an immense impact on, on the region, um, New Orleans particular, Louisiana particular. Um, but, but quite frankly, you know, the resources aren't without their challenges. Um, you know, we, we, you know, we have Louisiana loses about a football field of land about every 100 minutes. Um, that's a huge amount of land. That's a huge impact on fisheries habitat. You know, all of like the shrimp that the chef's cooking, those, those shrimp spend, spend some of their time in that estuary, part of their life cycle in that estuary before they move back out and they're caught and recruited into the fishery. Um, you know, wetlands are natural, um, you know, are, are natural um, barrier for storms and flooding. Um, and they protect the, you know, critical infrastructure and all of that, all of that's being lost. Um, you know, Louisiana is also the ground zero for, for climate change. So not only, you know, do we have subsidence, but you know, sea level rise starting to have an impact in, in Louisiana. Um, it's, it's starting to impact our fisheries in the Gulf of Mexico. So, so there are challenges that, that, you know, this restoration can help address. And so, you know, I'm, I'm excited about the, the strides that we are, we're, we're taking moving forward. Um, you know, Chris mentioned briefly some of the, you know, some of the, the coastal projects, you know, there's been dune and barrier projects, oyster reefs, Again, you know, a good um, synergy there with, you know, the, the living shoreline and the impacts it has to help protect, you know, erosion, but also feed us. Um, so, I mean, that's important. Uh, the open ocean restoration also is, in my opinion, super, super important. Um, you know, one of the things I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about to see, I work a lot in recreational fishery as well. Um, and there was a, a funding for a barrel trauma project that's going to put, you know, correct, Chris, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's about $30 million over the next seven years into, um, you know, improving the, the, the mortality of fish that are caught and then released for whatever reason. Maybe they're too small, maybe they're out of season. Um, traditionally, a lot of those fish die. And so, you know, by, by, Putting these fish descending devices that um, imp that that help 
um, restore them back down to the bottom. I should probably back up a little. Barotrauma obviously is the is the um, you know when your gas expands and similarly what the bends when when divers get the bends, uh, the same impact happens to some deep dwelling fish. And so uh, when they're brought up by hook and line too soon, um, you know the gas expands and it it makes them. Um, it makes it harder for them to swim back down. It makes them very vulnerable to predators and things like that. And so, you know, with this, they're going to study around the Gulf of Mexico what, you know, what, how well these, these uh, descending devices work, um, you know, and we're going to, you know, it's a real positive way to interact with fishermen. It's a win-win. Fishermen care about the resource. They don't like to kill fish that they're not going to take home and eat. And so, you know, there's some really exciting things happening in this in this restoration. So, um, Chris, I did have I did have one one question for you though. Like, I'm curious, you know, like maybe share with folks kind of where this where this restoration is in the process. I know some folks watching may be curious, like, well, how like is there anything I can do? Is there anything I can get involved with, you know, in this process? And I'm just I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts there. Yeah, that's a good question, Jeff. So, um, so each state, so there, there are two main Gulf-wide restoration bodies that are that that sort of have the, the most money to put toward restoration. There's the Gulf, um, there's the Restore Council, and then there's the Natural Resource Trustees for the Deepwater Horizon Restoration Program. And um, under the sort of trustee Natural Resource Damage Assessment column. You know, each state has been allocated a certain amount of funding to um, develop and implement restoration projects and periodically releases uh, for public comment restoration plans proposing to undertake, you know, a wetlands restoration project or a land acquisition project. So um, if, uh, and I have the website here that I will rattle off in a few minutes, but, you know, folks can actually peruse those, re those draft restoration plans and, and, and comment and weigh in if they like a particular project or if they think a project could be, could be strengthened, could be um, you know, improved, they can make recommendations there. Um, and so essentially this process of releasing draft plans, finalizing plans and, and implementing projects will go on really for the next 10 years. There's enough money um, in, in the bank uh, for both of these Gulf-wide restoration bodies to undertake restoration. And, and there'll be plenty of opportunities, as I mentioned, for, for, for the public and stakeholders to, to weigh in and, and comment on projects and also suggest projects. If they think that there are projects that aren't being implemented that, that should be considered, they can also recommend those uh, to the trustees through, uh, through a website, through a portal. Does that answer your question, Jeff? Yeah, thank, thanks. I think so. Uh, chefs, how's that red snapper uh, coming along? I'm still waiting for the technology where you can scratch and sniff, and I could. I wish I could smell that. So yeah, let's let's flip it back to Chef Brandon and and check on how the dish is coming along. That snapper is looking fantastic. Thanks to all the work that Ocean Conservancy has been doing over the last decade plus, New Orleans were able to have healthy snapper like this to source from. And everyone make sure to join hashtag Team Ocean if you're posting it all about Ocean Conservancy in the next few weeks. Um, being part of Team Ocean is something that Center Plate's proud to be. And in the meantime, I think we're ready with Chef to show off his snapper dish. Can you hear me now? Yes. Awesome. Yeah, so I just uh, just finished my uh, my corn macchio. I added a little bit of heavy cream to it, reduced that down. And then, uh, of course, in New Orleans fashion, we finished it out with some butter. Um, so right now I'm going to go ahead and plate that. I have my, we just, I like to just top it right on top with the snapper. And then two pretty, pretty golf fish. These are U10s. So that's the, it's the big boy size. And then I made a little bit of, um, I made a little bit of uh, some lemon blanc to go on top of that. So it's just a white wine butter sauce. So we're just gonna put that on top and go around. Can't get enough of that. And then garnish it up with some, some curly green onions. And that is our snapper dish. My stomach's literally growling right now. 
So, Chef, you've had the honor of working Saints games, college football national championship, uh, Super Bowls in New Orleans, concerts, Pelicans games, uh, th thousands, millions of, of guests per year eat dishes like yours. And today we got to taste a bit of, of your of your creation. So thank you so much for honoring us with uh, with this amazing snapper dish. And hopefully soon we'll be able to gather together and actually eat in a, in a large public gathering somewhere. So yes, absolutely. Thanks for having me. This was a this was a lot of fun. It's uh, I can't wait to get back to the kitchen with our with our team again. Absolutely agreed. So I, I think, uh, Chris, Jeff, we'll, we'll flip it back your way for, for some final thoughts on uh, the importance of, of eating and sourcing healthy in the Gulf region. And if you want to just uh, conclude here with, with some uh, final tips for, for people in the audience, if they want to live a more sustainable lifestyle when it comes to eating seafood and sourcing seafood in their daily lives. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, one of the sort of iconic species of the Gulf of Mexico, of course, is brown pelicans. Um, and, and this species was one of the most heavily impacted birds um, by the, the BP oil disaster. But, you know, Louisiana, along with its federal partners and, and, and other Gulf states, are restoring um, wetlands and barrier islands and improving nesting habitat for these iconic birds of the Gulf. And, um, uh, there is a photo that, that I think we have that we can show um, that uh, is appropriate because it shows the release of two brown pelicans that, that had been um, oiled and rehabilitated and, and released. And the reason why I think this photo is so appropriate um, in terms of what Chef Brandon and, and Centerplate are doing with respect to their work with the pelicans is that this image of these pelicans being released is really kind of like an image of recovery and hope for the Gulf region and its coastal and offshore habitats and waters. Um, and, you know, the Gulf region, New Orleans in particular, has just been, has shown to be resilient in times of crisis, be it, you know, Katrina, the BP oil disaster, or today with the challenges the state and city face with COVID. Um, and, you know, restoration is not done. Um, and we're just getting started here, but I like to say that ecosystem restoration is, is really, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, but we have come a long way in the 10 years since that, um, that infamous day in April, 2010. And it's really the people of the region, you know, who deserve the, the credit for continuously rising to the challenge of overcoming adversity, whether it's the, sh the shrimp fishermen who, who retrofitted their, their vessels to go out in the Gulf to help corral and clean up and, and burn the oil before it reached reach the, the marshes and, and oil the shorelines. Um, to the fishermen that, that, that are gonna be partnering and, and participating in, in some of the restoration projects that, that Jeff mentioned, the bear trauma, red snapper bear trauma project. I mean, this is a team effort, we're all in it together. Um, and I just really thank you for the opportunity to shine some light on the journey. So, Jeff, I'll turn it over to you for some of your parting thoughts. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, you know, when I opened my part of this discussion talking about how the ocean really impacts us all, and it, you know, it all also kind of brings us together, whether it be through food or through recreation or through, you know, our livelihoods. And you know, I think the thing that that I that I'm most moved by is that I, when, if you've ever been to New Orleans. You know, especially on a, on a Saints game day, um, one, if you've never had that opportunity, you should go. It's really an amazing experience. Um, it's really like unlike anywhere else. I mean, everything in the city practically stops. Everybody's together. Everybody's celebrating their hometown team, and they're gathered around typically seafood and great seafood at that. Um, and, and I think it's a, it's a really unique thing. Um, you know, in a world where we've got a lot of strife going on, you know, the togetherness that this seafood brings and this community brings is really something worth worth experiencing for yourself, and it's certainly worth preserving it. And you know, in order to kind of like, obviously, I'm proud to do our part to ensure that that these ecosystems remain productive, they remain healthy and sustainable. So you know, so so Americans can continue to eat seafood and kind of use it as a as a way to gather and come together and have good conversations. Um, you know, I think, I think it's really important, especially, you know, COVID has really shined a light on 
on supply chains and how people get their seafood. You know, a lot of fishermen have really been struggling during during the COVID pandemic, especially during the lockdown um, when restaurants were closed. I mean, obviously things are starting to open up and, and things are looking a little bit better for folks, but, you know, fishermen went in a hole. And so I encourage folks to go out and find some some good sustainable seafood and practice. Maybe use this recipe that, that chef used, practice in your kitchen. It's a lot of fun. Um, you know, sustainable choices are always better. There's lots of resources out there that you can, that you can use to help, help, help find that, you know, your, oftentimes your local grocery stores, you know, are doing a good job. And in the United States, if you look for a domestically produced wild caught product, you know, you know, that's a really good choice. You may, you may, it's very confusing out there with the choices, but, you know, at the bottom line, if you stick with a domestic product, um, you know, you, you have a pretty good chance of, uh, of it being sustainable. Like I said, the, the fisheries law in the United States has done a really good job of, of helping us manage these fisheries and, and kind of bring stocks back and recover them. And so that's always a safe choice. Um, our friends at the Marine Fish Conservation Network, uh, a group of, of conservation organizations and fishing organizations that come together, they've done a tremendous job of of pulling together a list of places. So wherever you are in the country, hopefully there's one for you, or you know, a place close by where you can source some of this seafood. Um, in the Gulf of Mexico, if you're tuning in from the Gulf of Mexico, um, the, the Shareholders Alliance, the Gulf of Mexico Reef Fish Shareholders Alliance, have, um, which is a, a group of commercial fishermen who, who work on sustainable fisheries and, and promoting, promoting commercial fisheries. They've done a really good job of pulling together um, you know, resources for folks who want to help support fishermen. Uh, so, and Chef, I'm sure, I don't know if you have a seafood provider there in New Orleans or a group of folks, I'm sure you've got a lot more recommendations there locally, but I think that's how I'll leave it. You know, go out, eat some seafood, um, and, and thanks for, for tuning in today. Yeah, I want to. I want to just uh, reiterate my thanks and appreciation to to Chef and and Paul and Center Plate for inviting Ocean Conservancy here. To talk about our work, restoration, seafood sustainability. So, just FYI, the the website where folks can go to get more information on the restoration process is www.gulfspillrestoration.noaa. That's N O A A. Dot gov. So gulfspillrestoration.noaa.gov and you can go and sort of explore all those um, sort of sub subtabs there. And I'll turn it back over to you, Paul. Okay, so thank you, Chris, Jeff. Thank you, Michael, behind the scenes at Ocean Conservancy. Ocean Conservancy does a, a great job uh, each and every day for, um, for our oceans, our waterways, our, our globe, uh, not only during World Oceans Month, but during each month of the year. Uh, these dishes look great. Thank you, Chef Brandon, for joining us on behalf of Center Plate and Sodexo. Uh, next time you are in New Orleans and once uh, our venues are, are fully open and up and running, we'd love to see you at a, a Saints game, a Pelicans game, at the New Orleans Convention Center, the World War II Museum. Uh, we have a, such a, a deep, great connection with the city of New Orleans, and we're looking forward to seeing you all once life gets back to more normal soon. So. Uh, we're excited to welcome you all back to our venues. We're excited for um, our friends and neighbors in New Orleans who get to have this incredible cuisine each and every day. And we've spoken a lot today about community. So I'm going to share with you now as well just some of the uh, minority-owned businesses in New Orleans who you can hopefully support uh, and, and dine out at and order from if you're, if you're in and around New Orleans right now. Um, and we'll leave you with this. And we hope that everyone has a safe and healthy week. Uh, please, of course, check back with us and keep an eye out for our follow-up and, and takeaways from today. We'll include recipes and images of the dishes that Chef Brandon made. And thank you all for joining us. Stay safe. Until next time, wish you all a happy World Oceans Month and a fantastic day, night, and weekend. Thank you all.